Hello and welcome to this EUA webinar, the first in our series called A New World. And the introductory webinar here is fittingly called A New World, um, where we're going to look a little bit at the policy framework and the, how universities are dealing with geopolitical changes. So uh, as a word of introduction, as I said, this is our first webinar in the series A New World. And the reason why we have this series is that we, at least at the policy level, noticed a much more cautious discourse around international cooperation, where I think some of us will remember that before it was more, the more cooperation, the better, the more partners, the better. We now talk more about foreign interference. In Brussels, you have buzzwords like strategic autonomy or open strategic autonomy, technological sovereignty, and the like. So we like to go into this topic and see, are we living a new world? What is the policy framework? And what does it look like on the ground? And that's the format that we will follow, be it on the overall topic today, the EU uh, strategy, in, be it on transatlantic relations, or in December when we'll talk about guidelines for foreign interference. Um, so, Connecting the political and the practical. That's our, our vision for this. But before we go on to our list of speakers, I'll introduce them one by one. Um, let's have a small poll and see what it looks like where you're sitting. Are we right to say what we say here from Brussels or is it different around Europe and around the world? Um, so you'll see a small poll here with a question. That's, that's interesting. So only 15% say this is from concrete experiences we had with partners. And uh, the second most popular is pressure from government, government and media. University leadership, 18%, and others, 37%. So that could be interesting uh, to, to, to dig into why, why is it? It's not one, it's not the other. And um, this may be something we didn't imagine when we asked the question. But maybe we can get an answer from a, a survey that was done by UA last year on international cooperation and, and how that worked. And to do that, I have my colleague here, Elena Klaes Kulik, who will go through uh, the, some slides that uh, will show you a little bit of insight in international cooperation and, and uh, how that looked in, in, in that survey. So please, Annalena. Yeah, thank you very much, Thomas. Good afternoon also from my side. I'm happy to present you with a few key results of a survey that we have conducted last year, just at the beginning of last year, so still a little bit before the pandemic where we asked our members and institutions about how they collaborate internationally. And internationally here also mean, can also mean within Europe or globally. Um, first, a little bit about the sample. So we received 219 responses from 34 higher education systems across Europe. So you can see it's broader than just the EU because of course also EUA is broader than just the EU. May I just briefly ask my colleagues to get the slides back? Yes, thank you very much. Very good. Okay, and you can see that um, we've left this here as a small caveat information. It's not representative of, of EUA membership or of uh, Europe's universities because we have more answers from some systems like Germany, Hungary or Italy and a bit less from France or Poland, for instance. So. Uh, you have to take that into account when we look at the further results, but it still gives you a very good idea of how globally connected Europe's universities are. Because they have seen internationalization as a strategic issue already for quite a while, and it has been part of institutional strategies for a longer time. We know this also from the regular EUA trends uh, survey that we conduct. In the survey here um, that, that we conducted last year, more than half of respondents said that internationalization is actually part of their general strategy, and a bit more than 40% have a specific international strategy in place. So you can see that it is quite an important issue 
for universities at strategic level. When we asked our members about the international activities they are conducting, you can also see quite uh, uh, an interesting diverse picture. It starts with almost all respondents having student credit mobility, um, but also more than 90% engaging in EU research projects. And that can be within different uh, programs. I'll come back to that in a minute but also staff mobility is still quite important for about 90%. When we asked um, respondents about the type of partners they work with, uh, we got some interesting results because you can see here that similarities still uh, seems to play quite an important role. More than 90%, almost 100% say that we, they have um, collaboration going on with universities, higher education institutions with a similar profile in another country. But also complementarity is important uh, for quite a number of the partnerships. Um, and partnerships with universities are followed by also partnerships with business and industry or also the non-governmental sector in other countries. So not only University collaboration is such as important, but also with other sectors. When it comes to international partners locations, um, we can see that Europe's universities are truly global players because most of the institutions we asked have really partnerships all across the world. And they collaborate in very many different ways and in different activities with partners in the four world regions. We've also then asked about what are the top three partner regions. And there you can see that the European Union comes up very, very high. But almost half of respondents also say that North America is among the top three partner regions. And more than one third say this about China. The European Union programs are very, very important as a framework for international collaboration for the respondents. Here you can see that almost 100% say that they engage in Erasmus student and staff mobility, but also the research framework program here at the time it was still Horizon 2020 is quite important for more than 80%. And the EU programs here clearly appear as being much more important than uh, programs, bilateral programs at national level. We also asked about the priorities for internationalization and here you can see or one could say that the time of internationalization for the sake of it seems to be a little bit over. So the strategic uh, importance of selecting partners for strategic partnerships is becoming more important and universities really use international collaboration to enhance the quality of the missions enhancement in, of quality of learning and teaching is being seen by almost 70 percent as very important uh, in terms of their priorities these were a few selected key results if you want to know more we also have a little video about this but please don't watch it now stay with us here so can you look at that later yeah thank you very much i think i think what we got out of that survey was really you know universities are incredibly globally connected. And when you try to cross some of these, you can also see, you know, it's not that they choose between China or the US, many of them actually have a, a completely different mix of, of partners. But staying with the overall picture, let's now go to Adam Tyson, uh, who is a senior advisor in the European Com Commission. Um, and I don't think we say too much if we say that we go pretty straight to the source of the new European Commission strategy, I should say EU strategy, because the member states were very enthusiastic about this recently, um, for, uh, for global research and, and innovation. So, Adam, could you please tell us what, what, what are the framework we're, we're looking at at the European level? Thank you very much indeed, Thomas, and I'm very pleased to, to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is the new EU global strategy for research and innovation. And it's very interesting to see the results of the EUA survey, which we, of course, had looked at before um, as we were drawing up a lot, lots of our thoughts. Um, 
So we are not going to be looking at the higher education side in, in what I say now, um, but of course there are many links, but also many differences between the international engagement strategies on the higher education side and, and on research and innovation. Um, so so uh, let me share my screen and I will um, take you through very, very quickly um, the, the, new, um, the, the new strategy. Let me see if I can do this uh, successfully. So you should be able to see my screen now um, with our our new um, logo, if you like, for this new uh, this new strategy. Um, you've called this seminar a new world, and I think that's important for us too, because we've been very much been thinking about this new strategy in the light of what we had already presented back in 2012 and looking at what the differences are between 2012 and now in terms in particular of the, of the geopolitics. Um, and I thought that the results of the, of the survey question about why people have become more cautious in terms of their international engagement was very interesting. Um, if, you, if you add it together, the pressure from governments and media and the pressure from university leadership, you got to around 50% of people. And then in the other uh, section, I'm, I'm imagining that um, some people have changed their approach to international cooperation, um, not because of pressure, but because of they are aware themselves that there have been changes in the geopolitical uh, context. And um, I'm trying to move my slide on and I cannot do it now. I don't know why that is. There we go. Um, so, so one of the reasons, uh, of course, is that um, there have been changes. Uh, we've seen big changes in the US, of course, in the last um, 12 years, going one way and then a little bit back the other. Um, we've seen changes in terms of the rise of China. We've seen difficulties uh, in our relationships with Russia um, uh, other countries around the world where we've had to reposition ourselves and rethink the way that we are working. And this has affected the approach of the union, not just in research and innovation, of course, but in all of the policy areas which are covered by, by the EU. And, and these are just some of the, the, the points that um, the Commission President, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, has um, set out in her own uh, strategy as to how we need to be different. I'm not going to go through all of these now, but these are just um, some points that we need to bear in mind as we are thinking about our strategies also in terms of uh, the university area and our international cooperation in general. So when we look at the global approach to research and innovation, we decided to make some changes um, and some adaptations. And, and Thomas has mentioned this um, already. Firstly, we want to preserve our openness. Uh, it's openness is extremely important, and, and you all know why. You know much better than I do. Um, in in terms of the quality of our um, research and innovation, the quality of our of our education. So it's extremely important that we um, focus on that. But we also need to think about um, uh, reciprocity, about what our overall interests are when we are opening up to cooperation with other with other uh, partners. We also decided that one of the things that we need to really strengthen in our new approach is uh, the multilateral uh, aspect. We've done an awful lot as the European Union and as individual countries within uh, the European Union in terms of our bilateral relationships. We need to invest more now in multilateral in particular to tackle the global challenges. So the, 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 the Green Deal um, issues, climate issues, digital issues, health, of course, that's become obvious uh, over the last 18 months and, and in innovation. And we're going to do this um, uh, in, the, in the ways that you see there on the right hand side of the screen in terms of adapting our cooperation with individual countries. Um, making sure that we continue to focus on developing countries and the need to uh, help to build their capacity and working much more closely with the member states themselves so that we have um, uh, an increased um, uh, critical mass, if you like, of the union and its member states working together in the same direction so that we have the biggest possible impact on, on the challenges that we're facing. So I mentioned that you know openness is is crucial, and you see that again on the on the slide there. But at the same time, we need to balance that openness with 
a need for the respect of our values and principles. You see some of them, there are, there are more, but some of them on the slide there. Um, we need to make sure that researchers um, scientists who are cooperating with partners ar around the world feel that they are in a respected environment where they know what to expect in terms of the values that will be applied to their research cooperation, some of the framework conditions which will be applied in terms of things like intellectual property and, 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 uh, and you know, ethical approaches to, to, uh, to research. Um, and we also need to make sure that when we are engaging with partners, that we are getting the impact out of it, not only in terms of the research results, but also in terms of the influence that Europe can have in the world in terms of its science diplomacy, the connections that we're building, um, making sure that we are using that research to spread our values, our approaches um, around the world. And of course, many of those values are shared by our international partners. So what do we mean when we're talking about this level playing field? Um, you know, what are the aspects that we need to, to focus on? Um, certainly questions about access to innovation ecosystems. We know that you know, Europe is very open when it comes to the access of um, foreign companies to our ecosystems, um, to, to our support for innovation, the access of small companies, for example, to our, to our markets is very, very open. That's not always the case in other parts of the world. So we need to argue for an opening up in a reciprocal way. We need to make sure that we are cooperating on standards I and mean, industrial standards, technical standards, digital standards, uh, in order to make sure that we are creating an interoperable system around the world, which also supports our companies in terms of selling their own products and services. We need to make sure that you know, access to, to state support um, is equally open to European companies when they are abroad. And then I already mentioned you know, the question of intellectual uh, property rights. And then lastly, the, the one of the key issues that has been raised both in the European Parliament and in the Council is that when we are opening up our own programmes, we need to make sure that other countries are opening their equivalent programmes to European uh, research organisations. That's uh, extremely important and we'll be putting a lot more emphasis on that in future. So, um, you know, in practice, how do we do this? I mean, first of all, um, one of the things that we um, want to do is to develop these principles for international cooperation. And there is going to be a conference uh, in Marseille um, under the French presidency next year where we will start this dialogue with our key uh, third country partners. We will develop um, bilateral roadmaps for research and innovation cooperation with, with key countries. We've already started to do this, of course, with China. I'm not saying it's easy, but we are, we are doing it and we have made some progress in terms of the thematic areas for cooperation. Um, some progress on some of these framework conditions, but we still have a lot, uh, a lot of progress to, to make on that. We are um, also going to present as the Commission some guidelines on how we deal with the risk of foreign interference in our own research and innovation uh, systems. Uh, many countries in Europe are already dealing with this sort of, um, this sort of issue and have issued guide guidelines for, for this. We are going to do this at a, at a European level. And we will also be um, issuing some advice and guidance in this code of practice on how to deal with intellectual property issues uh, in the international context. Um, I wanted to say a little bit also about how do we work in this multilateral way. Now, we, we know that um, you know, the, the global cooperation um, is obviously necessary to tackle these global challenges. Um, you know, some, some obvious examples on the slide there in terms of the, the health and climate risks. Um, but we also need to bring countries together in multilateral platforms in order to work together to share efforts to pool efforts and um, so that we are not duplicating what other countries are doing sometimes maybe better than we are able to do um, uh, here in, internally and so that um, the research results can be shared so that in, in an open science um, format so that we can uh, collectively move together as the world to solve these uh, to solve these problems. 
Some of you will be familiar with some of these uh, platforms that exist already. There are there are some of those um, in the marine area, for example. I've mentioned the All Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance here. Um, uh, there's uh, platforms on clean energy um, research through Mission Innovation. Many examples in the health area. I mean, the the access uh, to COVID nineteen accelerator was um, was very important. You know, in the in the early stages, is still working very well. We have lots of cooperation with Africa on the um, European Developing Countries uh, clinical trials work. Um, we have we have fewer um, international platforms in the industrial and digital areas, but they're starting to work and focusing particularly on standards issues. I mean, this is going to be very important uh, in, in terms of developing new standards. Standards You maybe heard about um, the EU-US uh, uh, cooperation in the Trade and Technology uh, Council meeting of last week, where there was an agreement to focus on ethical uses of artificial intelligence, for example, that will be very important. Um, and then, of course, there is this new European Bauhaus, which looks at um, standards for the built environment, and their um, international links are also going to be very important. Now, in order to, to deliver this overall strategy, um, it's important for us to see what this means in terms of our cooperation, our bilateral cooperation with individual countries. Multilateral is important, but it won't work unless you have strong bilateral cooperation um, underneath it. And um, based on these questions about reciprocity, about the existence of a level playing field, about the respect for rights and, and, and values, and of course, taking account of both what are our interests in the European Union and the interests of our partner countries. This is not a unilateral um, uh, approach. We will modulate how we cooperate with third countries um, as a function of all of those features. Um, and of course, um, we want to continue cooperating in particular with industrialized countries, with strong research and innovation uh, countries around the world. And I've just mentioned the Trade and Technology Council with the with the US. Uh, we also have a letter of intent with Japan, for example. Um, but there are many other um, in industrialized countries where we have very strong uh, cooperation and, and we expect that to continue. And um, we also want to develop our cooperation with the emerging economies. So, you know, China and Brazil and, and Russia. But there we are being a little bit more more um, selective, um, looking at, at um, these issues of reciprocity, which are not always easy, and therefore um, using our openness to cooperation as a lever to have an impact on other questions like you know, ethical approaches to, to research, like um, the protection of, of intellectual property, um, and, and you know, the other issues that we're focused on. Obviously, the countries of the European you know, neighborhood, you know, EFTA, Western Balkans, you know, Turkey, um, the, the neighborhood to the east and to the south are very important. UK is, of course, now a neighboring country um, in terms of the, of the European Union. Still very important that we um, continue our cooperation uh, with, uh, with um, all of these, these countries in, the, in the, the European region. And as I mentioned before, you know, developing countries in Africa and Latin America, I could also have mentioned you know, uh, Southeast Asia, um, are also very important. And there again, we'll be looking at um, prioritizing on the basis of agreements with these regions. So we already have an agreement with the countries of Latin America through the CELAC um, roadmap. We have agreements um, with the African Union also for, with four priority areas that we will um, uh, continue to focus on. And the key um, issue here is that we should co-design these initiatives with our partner countries. This is not going to be uh, Europe simply saying um, these are the areas that we want to focus on, we want to open up, take it or leave it. This is about um, a negotiation, it's about co-design, it's, it's about co-creation and making sure that we are really um, offering uh, uh, possibilities which are going to support partners um, around the world. Uh, and you see there also that um, we want to focus with low and middle income countries also on their uh, their capacity to, to deliver research and innovation. And that will be done particularly through 
our uh, development cooperation uh, programs such as N NDG as you as you see there on the on the screen so I mean that that is a, a whistle stop uh, tour through the um, through the strategy um, this was a proposal made by the Commission back in May it has just been endorsed by the council uh, so by the member states um, at the very end of September it's being discussed also in uh, in the European Parliament and in the European Economic and Social Committee where there's also been very strong support for this this more nuanced um, uh, um, uh, approach um, based on uh, openness as the starting point but also a much um, a much deeper consideration given to what is the European interest in cooperating with individual partners around the world thank you very much indeed thank you very much Adam um, we'll, we'll keep the questions uh, to to the end um, and, and you're very, very welcome to, to write also during the presentations and when it comes into your head and the, on the uh, questions and answers in chat that you have there. So not the chat, but the one that's called Q&A. And uh, I, I think this was, this was interesting. We've, of course, been in, in dialogue about this from, from the very start, but the, the notion that openness is the default and you modulate after that and see how open can you stay, at least for UA, was, was very comforting because we've been so much on the open side of, 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 uh, of this debate. But I think um, we should also take, get a reality check, let's call it like this, from the uh, university side. And to do that, we have with us Bernd Markert, who's director of the... Um, uh, the Institute for, for Mechanical Engineering at the Rheinisch Westfalische Hochschule, Technische Hochschule, or RWTH, among friends. It's difficult no matter how you say it. <laughs> um, but one of the leading technical universities in Europe, I think you can say that without making any error. So, Bernd, how, how does this look from where you sit? So this is perfect. So thank you uh, for this opportunity to give a presentation over here. And of course, I uh, will do my best to provide you with a reality check or uh, how Thomas has called it. Um, so in principle, um, before uh, really going uh, into the details, uh, I want to set a framework. So this should now not be an advertisement. So this is more that you understand what RWTH Aachen University is. So we are a technical university and uh, so we have roughly 50,000 students and uh, about 60% of them are studying engineering disciplines. Yeah? So that means we are really focusing on engineering. And uh, so another number I like to uh, give to your attention is uh, the financial volume. So the total budget is uh, uh, more than 1 billion uh, euros. And this is now actually uh, one of the points. If you look to uh where the money comes from then you see okay we are a state uh, university uh, meaning about 50 percent are from the state of north rhine westphalia but the other 50 percent are from project funds and out of this uh half billion uh, euros there is about 20 percent from industry and the private sector uh, so this is important to know and of course Based on that, it means that we have international collaboration. So we are not just uh, in contact with uh, companies in Germany or Europe. So this is worldwide. Yeah? And therefore, uh, of course, our international office uh, is, uh, of course, or has a certain strategy. And this is what I like to explain to you a little bit. So, uh, of course, we have different levels of partnerships. So there are uh, strategic partnerships, there are premium partners, and we heard it before, that was from, uh, let's say, uh, what has been shown at the beginning, that, uh, of course, we also have uh, things in Europe. So there are certain alliances of universities. This is, for instance, Enhance or the Idea League, so the top five technical universities that actually built such an alliance where, of course, research uh, is going on, where we have let's say, exchange of students within the Erasmus program, for instance, but also of research. So this is a very common thing. But when it comes to, uh, let's say, e really international uh, kind of things, not within Europe, so outside Europe, then, of course, we've tried to follow a so-called bottom-up approach. So 
uh, that means uh, we try to have a strategic scaling. Yeah. So we start at an institute, for instance, and there are um, about 400 uh, agreements uh, of partnerships uh, on insti institute level. And uh, then, of course, these are scaled up if they are successful, such that we currently have about 100 agreements on the, uh, let's say, university level. Yeah, so usually you start at an institute with certain researchers that really work together. Yeah, and then if this is successful, then of course this could be uh, onto the come to the next level, to the faculty level, for instance. And then of course, if this is successful, that could be more than one faculty, and then up to the university level. So this is what we uh, uh, really think is is a good way. Yeah, so this kind of bottom up approach. However. There are certain uh, other problems. So if it's about international cooperations, especially when we talk about third party funding, so then there are a lot of challenges. Yeah, We, we know all about uh, them. So that is the pandemic that could be climate change and stuff like that. Yeah. So uh, we uh, I think we'll also talk a little bit about the geopolitical polarization, uh, about the rise of populism and stuff like that. Then threats to academic freedom, for instance, when we look to China, for instance, yeah, and uh, of course, uh, during the pandemic, we of course had a boost in this digitalization, not just in the educational part, but also in the research part. Yeah, so uh, it is very nice uh, today if we are, uh, if I do not need to travel anymore. Yeah? Uh, of course, we know that this is much, uh, for some instances, much better, but in, in principle, in the morning, I can have a, a a Zoom meeting with Indonesia and then later on uh, with Russia or whomever. And this would not be possible to do this in person, right? However, this digitalization also causes problems. Yeah, Data security, just to mention one. And the second one would be data literacy. Yeah, So these are things, of course, where we have to educate uh, our researchers, but also the administration at the end of the day in order uh, to uh, yeah, cope with these kind of uh, challenges that appear there. So when it comes then to uh, how is this uh, formed in a university and what is the strategy? And of course, there are certain fields we are looking at at RWTH Aachen University. Of course, you need a certain international profile. That means you need a network. I mentioned that that we have that in Europe, that we have that uh, overseas, yeah, and also certain offshore activities uh, that we are doing. But it's also about the culture. Yeah, so it has been mentioned uh, uh, by, by Adam so that there is also um, that we need values and stuff like that. Yeah, so this is clear. And uh, we added one additional uh, point. This is really um, that we say, OK, there has to be international responsibility. Yeah, so at the end, what we do not want to have is we do not want to have this so-called brain drain. Yeah, so what we want to have is a brain circulation. Yeah, so and we want to have an ecosystem that is then really uh, yeah, doing its best that we can uh, really have this what is uh, given there on, on the left hand side top. Yeah, so the offshore activities, capacity building, sustainability, and that we are formulating a code of conduct where we have all these quality assurance, security issues and everything like this included and that we have clear processes how we can tell, uh, let's say, my colleagues at the university, OK, when you try to cooperate with China, yeah, so please, here are, uh, let's say, certain processes that uh, give you somehow a framework uh, from where you can start. So this is uh, our intention uh, at the end. And uh, so these, uh, yeah, to give this guidance and solid framework for cooperations. So this is then typically done by the uh, university administration. Yeah, so the first thing is, of course, that we try to ascertain our institutional values. Yeah, yeah, and based on that, we come up with this uh, novel code of conduct. Yeah, and uh, respective uh, guidelines, as well as the processes, as I've just mentioned, uh, within the university, to uh, really secure uh, agreements and projects. Yeah, so this is uh, something which is very important, and but the highest priority. Uh, I have to admit, is really that we try to continue our fruitful collaboration. So that's what has been mentioned before, that we try to be open. Yeah, we want to be open. Yeah, because only this is, uh, is uh, let's say, the way that brings us further, especially when it comes to the challenges that we have, for instance, with the climate, for instance. 
Yeah. So this is uh, really important. We want to have the scientific discourse uh, outside of these geopolitical uh, arenas. So because uh, what we think is that, uh, of course, science and research is borderless or more or less. Yeah. So there are no um, it should not be affected by religion, by uh, racial issues, by political kind of issues and stuff like that. So this is really so the traditional way of thinking about, let's say, that science and research is borderless. The same is, of course, true for education. So and now I'd like to give you some examples. Yeah. So where we really have these um, hindrances and or let me call it pitfalls in international corporations. So you saw that RWTH Aachen is, uh, of course, uh, very well connected to industry and uh, this worldwide. So we had one lighthouse project uh, that was uh, driven by the Institute of Laser Technology here in Aachen, so which is also uh, connected to Fraunhofer. Yeah, so there is a, an associated Fraunhofer Institute. Yeah, and these guys, they invented this 3D laser printing stuff, right? So, and uh, we have a long collaboration with uh, the Tsinghua University in China. Yeah, so, and we set up a joint laboratory. Yeah, so that was also the, uh, the, the rector's delegate for China. Yeah, that uh, was uh, in charge of this uh, Fraunhofer Institute for Laser Technology. Yeah, and then uh, what happened is, of course, that the whole thing was blocked uh, by, um, let's say, German export controls. That was one thing. Yeah, and then later on by dual use concerns. And uh, this, this is then the problem. Of course, you can print in 3D, let's say, a unicorn. Yeah, but you can also print a knife or a weapon. Yeah, and this is now the problem, right? So that uh, this dual use problematic is really something uh, we should uh, think about how we can do that. Yeah. So there was another thing. So that is uh, on the right hand side, retroactive declaration of joint research as military collaboration. So the starting point was that there was, um, uh, yeah, a medical technology cooperation with a Chinese university, with a Chinese partner university. And the, uh, the, the goal behind that, or let's say the subject behind that, was an artificial heart. Yeah? And later on, it turned out that some of these things uh, are really, um, yeah, or can be used also for military kind of stuff. Yeah? But this was retroactive. Yeah? And this is something uh, which is really weird. And I have some other examples that are even more weird in, in this context. And this is uh, what we are, uh, let's say, with the university administration usually discussing. So that is really that these international collaborations yeah, increasingly pose a risk yeah, uh, of, uh, let's say, this um, yeah, causing damage, I would say, to the university reputation. Yeah? And one thing you see over here, yeah, so there was uh, a, a news article yeah, so that uh, some uh, RWTH Aachen Institutes of Mechanical Engineering, uh, that they did a feasibility study for uh, a certain tank factory in Turkey. Yeah, so they never did that. So what they did is, of course, they did a feasibility study for some production line uh, for a, a truck or a passenger car, so some special vehicles. Yeah, and so that was made out uh, of, of this uh, by the press. Yeah, so that was a problem. Yeah, another one was uh, on is here given on the right hand side. Yeah, so that there are technologies, of course, that are invented uh, at universities that can be used for civilian as well as for military purposes. Yeah, and this special thing was about quantum computing and no novel power supplies for ships, for instance. Yeah, and uh, another uh, example was non toxic insect repellent uh, uh, textiles. Yeah, and of course, you can use them in, in a civil framework, but you can also use them for military. And this is really somehow a problem. So this dual use problematic is really something uh, where we uh, are, yeah, where we need help also from, uh, let's say, the policymakers at the end that there are clear definitions how to deal with these kind of issues. Yeah, because as I showed you, this retroactive uh, categorization as uh, that this is military or can be used in military uh, applications uh, is really problematic. So um, let me point out a little bit what we have uh, with China, for instance, because that is something uh, which is currently also in the news, which we also observe on the European level. Yeah, so 
of course, we want to be open. And uh, before that, let us have a look uh, how long is our collaboration with China. So we started already in 1979. There we had the first agreement with the uh, former Beijing Iron and Steel Institute, yeah, which is nowadays the USTB. Yeah, 1979. So there we did not talk about all these kind of things we are addressing in the moment, right? But this is something uh, where we say, okay, there is a long history. And there is also a little bit of a trust in this direction when it comes to university partners. Yeah? And so that means this long lasting uh, strategic partnership that we have. And where out of that we had this uh, partnership with Tsinghua University. There, uh, of course, we have uh, one of the largest Sino German um, uh, double degree master programs. And of course, production and automotive engineering. Yeah? Nevertheless, this brings also problems because we are working with automotive industry, with the German automotive industry, and they, uh, to some extent, say, okay, you are not allowed to have, for instance, student workers uh, uh, in your team uh, when you do uh, some research for the automotive industry. Yeah, so these are uh, then some problems that we are facing. Yeah, and of course, for this, uh, we also would need certain regulations. Yeah, so that actually means we have a really uh, strong uh, fundament uh, in the collaboration with China. Yeah, and of course, so this joint research lab, as I've just mentioned, yeah, which was on laser technology. Yeah, so that is something is a very popular model, but also is problematic, as I've uh, explained to you. So what are the measures at uh, our university? What are we doing? So at the end, of course, you need expertise in, in this situation. So that means you also have to observe continuously the developments then, uh, for instance, here in this case in China. And um, you need these processes that I also have explained so that we need to shape these transparent processes in the administration, yeah, such that, of course, uh, we have clear guidelines such that uh, our, let's say, when, when I, as a professor, doing uh, collaborations and uh, certain uh, whatever uh, research and development contracts with Chinese companies or universities, that there is a clear guideline how to do that. Yeah, and this is a very important. Yeah? And what we also uh, already do is that we join forces. So with our European partners, in that sense uh, that uh, we try to get also a critical mass vis-a-vis yeah, -vis the policymakers yeah, so that we can really come to them and say, hey, look, this is really a problem from our side. So can you please help us? Can you change your, your policies in, in this direction? So and now, uh, finally, I was asked, okay, what uh, can or what support is needed uh, from the policymakers. And this is what I asked the administration. And uh, they uh, gave me the following, uh, let's say, uh, items. So the further harmonization of legal regulations within the Euro European Union. Yeah, I think so there we can, we can agree. Yeah, but what they also said is, okay, there should be a central contact point uh, which pools actually the knowledge and resources. So some sort of a European office of higher education institutions, yeah, which take care about the cooperation with third uh, countries. So that is something uh, which is very important uh, to their uh, meaning. And um, yeah, I, I fully agree with that. But I also heard that Adam was presenting a little bit in this direction. So uh, that is very nice. So then, of course, when it comes to the administration, of course, they need training. They need certain events where they can share their experiences and um, this is, of course, uh, important. And um, so what is uh, for us as researchers important are that we have these funding programs so that we can really, uh, in the sense so the industry would go for a joint venture, for instance. Yeah. So like Volkswagen in China and so forth. Yeah. Or Siemens and others. Yeah. So that is also something we can do such that we have joint projects together with them. And of course, for this, we need some funding. So this should be then a bilateral or multilateral funding at the end. And uh, of course, um, the recognition of the importance of global scientific cooperation as an effective form of diplomacy. So this is really something I can completely underline. 
So this uh, should not be underestimated. So this is really something what we can do, as I've said, so that science and research is borderless and also education is borderless. And uh, we can only have impact in this direction and somehow communicate our values and our what we think is our paradigms and so forth. Uh, if we uh, stay in touch with them. So uh, a closed system would never uh, be able to do that. So this is uh, what I would like to tell you on this kind of point. And uh, I thank you very much for your patience. And of course, I'm open for questions. And I hope, Thomas, that I gave uh, you the real world a little bit, at least. Uh, I think that is as real as real as it gets. I think I was extremely rich going from from dual use to uh, to multilateral funding, um, and and big questions. I think we have our work cut out for us. Uh, we have ten minutes for questions. So what I would do because we have a number of questions, and Adam has been very uh, kind to to uh, answer some of the more uh, factual ones from the Commission. So if you wonder uh, when foreign interference guidelines will be published, uh, you can you can look in the chat. But we will in any way have a uh, a webinar with the author of these foreign interference guidelines in, in December. So so you can stay tuned for that. Uh, there are issues here. There's some questions that are almost almost philosophical uh, from from Jana van der Molen that says. Um, if we try to export our values, if I understand the question correctly, are we then not making foreign interference ourselves? And I think it it uh, it, it fits with another uh, question from and uh, I can't see the whole name, but Armando Uribe, and um, saying uh, if should universities align with uh, geopolitical uh, orientations? It I, I have to make a little bit of public of publicity here. Uh, we just published a, a report on scenarios for the future, and some of the scenarios are really, you know, are we going to leave the different regions in their own, with their own values and, and not touch that, or should we engage in, you know, spreading our values around the world? So I'd like to hear from, from both of you, Adam and, and Bernd, in this value question, are we exporting, are we tolerating, are we aligning? What does what does that what does that look like? Maybe I'll start with bands. How, how does that look from? from yeah, sure. So I, I would not call it that we export our values. I would not say that. So what what we are let's say exporting is German engineering. So the whole thing around that, yeah. And of course that we we combine German engineering with certain values. I think this is uh, the way we should do it. So, but not really try to convince others. Yeah, the way we do it is the best. No, that is what I would never do. Yeah, but to really come with, so from, because that's my profession, I'm an engineer, right? So to really uh, get out, okay, what is German engineering? What are the values behind German engineering? Yeah, and if they are fascinated from German engineering, so not just the Chinese, also the Indians and so forth. Yeah, so then, of course, when it comes then to quality issues yeah so um, i just like to give you an example on that yeah if we have that time so um i think it was volkswagen um they they actually uh, copied one of the production lines uh, that is here in germany and they brought it to mexico yeah and or the us doesn't matter yeah and uh, then of course so the same the same robots everything the same yeah but the quality of the cars, so the the measures and stuff like that, uh, that they uh, that take care of the quality issues, yeah, it was not the same. Yeah, but why is it not the same? Of course, it could be something with the education of the workers and so forth. But it's also this German engineering to make things perfect. Yeah, yeah, you can now call this a value or not, but this is something uh, which goes hand in hand, in in my opinion. So I would not try to convince people about yeah, what are our values concerning the freedom of research no that is not what i would do i would go from a, a really technical uh, or content uh, kind of thing uh, in this direction and i would say if they are uh, eager to have products in the same quality so then they will to some extent adopt these kind of things yeah and this is i would say this would be my way of doing it okay i think that's that's very you know if our values will spread because 
they work better almost if, if I can if, if I would like it. What, what do you what do you think Adam? Uh, can we rest assured that democracy is better and uh, and it will naturally spread around the world or uh, what is I mean that's a challenge isn't it? I mean it was, it's very interesting to hear Bernd's you know view uh, you know as an engineer this is an engineer's view of how uh, of how these values um, spread and I completely agree with Bernd that excellence, you know, is a value. Excellence in engineering or in any other field, you know, is a European value. And, and that is, you know, one of the key priorities of the Horizon Europe program and all of the previous framework programs. Um, and so this insistence on excellence in our partnerships, you know, is very important. And it does spread. It does spread. You know, people want to be part of our, our cooperation and they know they have to reach, you know, our levels of, of excellence or something very close to it um, if we're going to partner with them. So, so I, I agree with that. It's where, where I would, because, you know, I'm a, I'm a policymaker, you know, so I'm looking at the policy level. And one of the things that strikes me is that we need to ensure that our researchers are operating in a policy environment which respects our values. Now, is this, is this foreign interference? No. I don't think this is foreign foreign interference in you know the internal arrangements of African countries or Latin American countries or of China. Um, you know what we are saying is that if you want to partner with us, not only do you have to reach our levels of excellence, but you also have to respect the way that we do research and innovation in Europe. And that means that you know if we are working on artificial intelligence, facial recognition, we don't use that as a technology to suppress the rights of our people. And, and if you do that as a partner, we will not work with you. So they have the choice. This is not foreign interference. They then have the choice as to how they respond to the offer that we have of partnership. And you know, they choose. And we hope, of course, that the impact of that will be, you know, okay, we will adapt. We will change the way we are thinking about these things. Now, Sometimes that will work and sometimes it won't. We have, you know, a strong degree of leverage as the European Union in terms of our, our values, our principles, our attachment to democracy. But we know that we don't convince everybody. But that means that we must choose more carefully about who our partners are and who we do business with. You know, I don't have any difficulty with the example that Bernd gave in cooperation with, you know, with the US or with, with Mexico or whoever. Um, but when it comes to more sensitive technologies, then we do need to be much more careful. And, and I think that's the message that we are we are wanting to send out. Without going into that whole discussion, I think Bernd's example of dual use, it were very good to say, what is a sensitive technology? Is heart surgery a sensitive technology? Yes, with all these transversal technologies we have, sometimes sometimes it can. I mean, I think, one of, our, I think one of our difficulties is, you know, what is not dual use these days? Yeah. You know, I mean, that's the that's the real problem. And with some some partners, you know, you know that their their university research system is actually a department of the Ministry of Defence. You know, so everything that they produce, they are sharing with their defence ministry. And so we have to think and it's it's not people like me because I don't understand all of this. It's people like Bounty who, who know you know, what the potential is for particular technologies that they're working on that have to think about this all the time. And that's really what the guidelines on foreign interference will be saying, is that this is a responsibility of scientists because scientists know what their technology is capable of. You know, policymakers really don't. So, so this has to be a partnership between the policy level in our you know, diplomatic contacts with other countries and the ground where the researchers, the scientists are cooperating with their counterparts in, in other countries in order to really deliver this change. Okay, we're almost out of time, but I do want to have one other question because it was, it was spawned, I think, by, by one of Bernd's uh, slides. Um, what about cooperation on market-driven factors? Uh, is, that a, is that a risk that you let market and, uh, let's say, for-profit uh, considerations guide your your uh, uh, your international cooperation. Yeah, so, Thomas, th this is really a good question uh, because we are always thinking about that and also fighting a little bit against that. So that is 
uh, it has something to do with the financial situation of a university. Yeah, so uh, because usually uh, we are compared then with the MITs of the world, you know. Yeah, and if you now look to the budget of MIT, yeah, so then um, one billion euro is nothing. Yeah, and and this is a little bit the problem. So uh, that uh, of course uh, we have to say yes, uh, we have a we have to look a little bit to the market. So what is relevant for our customers in the sense of industry yeah so because that is then the knowledge transform the transformation yeah so that we yeah so at least we are funded to 50 percent by the state yeah and uh, of course we do fundamental research but at some point yeah as an engineer you cannot dream of yeah so when was the uh, the the uh, when does the universe start and something like that so as an engineer, at the end of the day, there has to be a solution or a product, you know, and this is then something, okay, if the market uh, is going in a certain direction, then of course, yeah, um, there is also the need that university institutes somehow focus with their uh, research a little bit in this direction. But I would not say that uh, because that would mean that market is influencing what I will do tomorrow, but this is definitely not the case at least not in fundamental research. So uh, nevertheless, yeah, you cannot leave the market outside. So if, yeah, so we would still go on with, uh, let's say combustion engines, yeah, and not look to batteries and stuff like that, yeah, and electrical, electromobility, if we would not look to the market, right? So therefore, I would say, uh, it should not be like that, that for instance, a company gives us money, yeah, can you give us a study program or whatever? So this is what we would not do. Mm. You know? At least currently we would not do it. Yeah. So uh, and this is something that uh, let's say this the scientific freedom. So that's this is what I also mentioned, right? So this uh, of course we we observe the market and of course there are certain trends and we move on in this direction then, but we are not uh, somehow that much driven by that, okay, come to where the money is. No, I, I would say uh, most of my colleagues are not doing that. That, 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 that sounds a question. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds reassuring, I think. Um, very good. Uh, I, I think we, we've reached the end of, of our allocated time, which is, uh, of course, a pity because we could have talked there are many other good questions. I don't think we get to, to talk about Confucius Institutes or the, the uh, interface, artificial intelligence, digitalization, internationalization um, but I, I think there will be other opportunities to do that i had myself a number of questions about professionalization of staff for instance to to band or or uh, involvement of the neighborhood to uh, to adam and um, but it's definitely a discussion that will go on because there's so many good questions so if you want to follow that discussion you can see here our next webinars registrations are open you're going to have a look at transatlantic relations on the anniversary of the election of, of Joe Biden, so 3rd of November. And then we'll look at the big thing that was interesting here in the chat, risk assessment for international partnerships, which means also foreign interference guidelines. With a little bit of luck, we will have the European uh, guidelines published and we can go through them and discuss them at that point. So uh, enough to talk about. We're looking forward to see you again. Many thanks to all the speakers, uh, and and we'll we'll continue to to talk to each other. So bye for now. Perfect. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye.